Racist! Fascist! Okay, so greetings. This is Jolly Scholar Triple Eight. I'm sorry I'm a little bit late on producing my uh, next video, my follow up, but I had some uh, technical issues. But, anyways, here I am. Uh, this video has a long and perhaps a bit pompous title Gramsci, Hegemony, Cultural Marxism versus Jolly Scholar Triple Eight, The Ritual Spiral, and Techno Anarchism. I don't know, in a more vain moment, I might have called it. Uh, Gramsci contra Moi Girard, whatever. Okay, <clears throat> so this discussion is actually a prequel to a second short set of videos similar to the Seeger series I posted. The series will be on the Great Awakenings. The Great Awakenings were an actual historical series of cultural events that punctuated the history of the United States since its inception, all the way back to the uh, colonial era. The impressive impact of these cultural movements at every level, religious, civil rights, social justice, and even revolution, stand in stark contrast to the historic chain of humanitarian catastrophic failures that characterized all Marxist movements. And I don't even think Marxists would deny that. I'm going to call this mini-series Into the Forest, the Satcher Procession, a commentary on the American Great Awakenings. The term, the Satcher Procession, I'm borrowing from Nietzsche. And I think that after you've watched the series, you'll agree that the unexpected metaphor really does work. Okay, so why Gramsci and hegemony? And that's really the, uh, the subject, hegemony. I think that studying the flaws of cultural Marxism, where and why it fails, we can better devise strategies of resistance to it, especially since it has already metastasized so deeply into so many of our social institutions. So first, I'll talk about four central ideas that Gramsci brought forth. The first, uh, the most important, is hegemony. Second, common sense. Third, attack and replace. And fourth, the strategic process itself, cultural Marxism. I'll be contrasting Gramsci's ideas with my own. Uh, the ritual spiral, which is a model of culture I developed during my doctoral thesis, involves culture, religion, ritual system, uh, the ecstatic experience. I formulated an idea around this uh, term, knowledge of the self. Self to the self, self to the community, self to the operational environment, and the most important one really is self to the cosmology. There is, uh, at, at present, the only scientific model, the closest thing we have to modeling the ecstatic experience is called biogenetic structuralism. And I will be doing possibly an entire video on that. By a fellow named Charles Laughlin and uh, Eugene Dakili. Then, uh, freedom and creativity, right? It sounds obvious, but I, you will see that it's really in stark contrast to cultural Marxism, believe it or not. And then, my concept of techno anarchism as an antidote to ideology, ideology as a disease, and also as a model to how to go forward beyond dominance and submission which are the characteristics of aristocratic culture that's, frankly, served us well for millennia. But it's time for humanity to move beyond that. Okay, however, I won't be going into much depth into these concepts I just uh, described, because those ideas constitute my entire purpose for launching the Jolly Scholar Triple H series in the first place. My discussion series is itself a platform for, for presenting these ideas to the public, you the public. Ideas that obviously I believe will make an important contribution to the cultural dilemma that we're now facing. Okay, and so with the ritual spiral model of cultural generation and the more social political model of techno anarchism as the informing principles behind this second mini series, I will go on to post a video on each of these five subjects. The first one is the first Great Awakening, uh, 1730s to 1740s. So obviously the colonial era. The Second Great Awakening around 1800 to 1835. The Third Great Awakening, 1850s to 1900s. The Fourth Great Awakening, 1960s to the 70s. And, bear with me here, Transformational Culture or Transformational Festivals. Uh, I'm using the title Electronic Awakening, a discussion of, excuse me, Electronic Awakening, a discussion on Transformational Festival. I took the term Electronic Awakening from an actual documentary by A.C. Johnner. 
Yeah, I know. Most of you might think that the entire subject of transformational festivals is a bit hokey. But bear with me. Uh, you might change your mind at least a bit. Okay? So on with the discussion. Gramsci, hegemony, and cultural Marxism versus Jolly Scholar Triple Eight, the ritual spiral and techno anarchism. But for short, there may be more vain, Gramsci contra Gerard. Whatever. Anyways, Antonio Francesco Gramsci, born 22nd of January, 1891, died April 27th, 1937, was an Italian Marxist philosopher, journalist, linguist, Writer and politician, he wrote on philosophy, political theory, sociology, history, and linguistics. He was a founding member of the one-time leader and one-time leader of the Communist Party of Italy and was imprisoned by none other than Benito Mussolini, uh, who is the head of the fascist, uh, the fascist regime. And we've already discussed that uh, Benito Mussolini was at one time a communist. So Gramsci wrote more than 30 notebooks and 3,000 pages of history and analysis during his imprisonment. His prison notebooks are considered a highly original contribution to 20th century political theory. Gramsci drew insights from various sources, not only other Marxists, but also thinkers such as Niccolò Machiavelli, uh, Ifredo Barreto, George Sorrell, uh, and many others. Uh, it's a pretty long list here. But Gramsci was best known for his theory of cultural hegemony. Gramsci expanded on this idea, arguing that the bourgeoisie maintained power primarily through their cultural hegemony, that is, their control over all facets of culture and the promulgation of their values. And this explains why the proletariat revolution that Marx predicted had not happened, and he, he means in the West. In effect, the workers have adopted bourgeois values as their own, seeing them as common sense, even though they run counter to their own interests. The, the concept of common sense, for those of you who have been in the universities in the last 15 years, is denigrated as being embedded, the embedded values of structural racism. That's how they get around it. In other words, they don't want you to have any common sense. <laughs> you can really see the results of that, right? You don't even know what, uh, what sex you are. I digress, okay. For change to happen in society, the working class needs to develop its own culture based on its own self-interests. To, to do this, it needs to form alliances and compromises with other groups. The ideology it develops thus must extend well beyond the narrow economic interests and address the moral and spiritual needs of people. Then, only when it develops such a counter-hegemony that can challenge and ultimately replace the cultural hegemony of the bourgeois Will the communist revolution succeed? Gramsci further believed that meaning comes from the interaction between human activity and larger historical and social processes, right, material uh, dialectic. Knowledge is fundamentally social, that is, it is based in the relationships between people who hold the ideas. This comes very close to the postmodern view that the truth is a social construct. The bottom line here is that for social progress and the liberation of the worker to occur, the current culture and value system must be attacked and replaced. And we're going to come to, back to that. With a new one that reflects the interests of workers and more broadly, the oppressed. Establishing this new truth is critical to human liberation. This doesn't sound bad, right? The oppressed have embodied the values of their oppressors. Okay. Uh, it's an ass backwards view of how culture emerges. And of course, as we already saw with the Pete Seeger series, the Marxists still haven't learned that lesson. Okay, so I'm going to dissect what I just read to you and just look at the salient parts. This, of course, is a very uh, key sentence. In effect, the workers have adopted bourgeois values as their own, seeing them as common sense. Now, keep in mind, first of all, the bourgeois was like the middle and upper classes really the middle class that was emerging, that had emerged and was doing very well in uh, early 20th century, late 19th century Europe, which of course now is suddenly what all of our today's Marxists suddenly extolling the middle class, right? But again, that's, it's, 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 it's a detail, it's not that important, it should be obvious to, to many of you. So once again, 
In effect, the workers have adopted bourgeois values as their own, seeing them as common sense. All right, the deconstruction of common sense as a, manis- as a manifestation of white privilege or Eurocentric domination goes a long way to explain the comma, excuse me, quote, clown world phenomena that we are witnessing. Clowns running amok as they reject common sense, right? Uh, they don't know what sex they are. Nothing against the, the fluidity of gender, but we've taken this to a degree that's bordering on insanity. Not bordering on insanity. It has entered clown world. It has entered insanity. Okay, even though they run counter to their own interests. Okay, it's a complete misunderstanding of how cultural values arise. A typical Marxist top-down explanation for all social phenomena. Consequently, all their solutions are top-down projects. This is their weakness. This is the real Achilles heel. The Marxists must do top-down because no matter how much they try to go bottom-up and feel like they're part of the people and think that they're going to get the people on their side, it never happens. Never. And it's not happening now. We can see the betrayal of the working class is a hallmark of Marxism, of socialism in today's America. I went through that in the, P- in the Seeger uh, series. That's exactly what they've done. The working class of America has been thrown to the wolves. They're not interested in them anymore. They're, just in the, they're interested in the college graduates who they've indoctrinated. And now all the way down to the, uh, beyond the, they're in the elementary, elementary schools or even going into the preschools. Okay, for change to happen in society, the working class needs to develop its own culture based on its own self-interest. Again, their top-down thinking is just crazy. These people never left the universities. They had no clue who the working class were. Marx he never worked a day in his life. Really? And the working class, the public, are going to learn that culture or any culture from the intellectual Marxists? Really? They will learn not to use their common sense and trade it in for the clown world common sense of the cultural Marxists? But from where does culture and cultural values arise in the first place? From intellectuals? No, absolutely not. And you can see that this is why it's important that I develop uh, for you, my viewers, this concept of the ritual spiral because it is a model of how culture arises and has nothing to do with intellectuals. To do this, it must extend well beyond narrow economic interests and address the the moral and spiritual needs of people. Exactly. And what moral and spiritual needs can possibly derive from a postmodern approach to truth? Truth as propaganda generated by the elites. Our clown world antics where a man self-identifies as a woman wrestler and walks off with a trophy, that's that's the spiritual, moral uh, truths that this fool thinks that the, uh, well, not this fool, I, I, think, I think if Gramsci was alive today, he'd be wondering, oh my God, what did I put in motion? So as we can see this concept that the elites will produce cultural values is ridiculous. And we are seeing it in the clown world manifestation that we're witnessing right before our, our, right before our eyes today. Okay, so the bottom line here is that for social progress and the liberation of the workers to occur, the current culture and value system must be attacked and replaced. Remember, I had, I had not read this terminology used before. I was calling it gutting and replacing, but attacked and replaced. Establishing this new truth is critical to human liberation. No humans have been liberated of anything after a hundred plus years of this ideological disease. On the contrary, mass incarcerations, mass starvation, genocide. Gramsci is asking the wrong question. He was asking, why did Marxists start to fail so early in its development? Why it was not taking hold in the West and why it had never truly succeeded at all despite the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. So let's interrogate this notion of hegemony. Gramsci identifies ideology in in conjunction with cultural hegemony. And as I said, he's right. He is right. He identified the problem, the problem for Marxists. But this is a mistake from the onset, as we'll see. Notice he identifies ideology with cultural hegemony. It's not ideology. 
ideology as a result. Gramsci should have asked, why do traditional societies succeed? The ones he was trying to attack and replace, or, so we use the term now, deconstruct. Why are traditional societies so long-lasting? Why are generations after generations willing to work, support, fight, and die in order to maintain traditional societies and culture? That's what he should have looked at and asked, why do they succeed? It would have told him a whole lot more than why does Marxism fail? But it is to culture, these systems of values and worldviews that Gramsci correctly attributed the intense resistance to socialism, where he thought it should have succeeded most in the developed West. In other words, he, he did correctly see that culture is what was standing in the way of Marxism moving quickly through Western civilization. So he was brilliant in that sense. He understood what the real problem was. But again, he's asking the wrong question. He's right. Culture is the obstacle. What Gramsci is calling hegemony is a result, not a cause. But of what? Of culture. Culture brings what he is calling hegemony, hegemony into being. Now, you think I just restated what he said? No, not really. Culture brings about hegemony. But he is attributing hegemony to ideology and social institutions and then saying that's what caused culture. This is completely backwards. Culture creates social institutions, not the other way around. In fact, culture can generate ideologies as byproducts, but not the other way around. Ideologies cannot generate culture. But more specific to Gramsci, social institutions do not create hegemony. You see, it's a result, so it gives you the illusion that it does. That is a typical Marxist top-down interpretation of human behavior and of human culture in general. Social institutions are the result of a coherent, robust culture. Not the cause, the result. It is culture that brings social institutions into being, not the other way around. So even if you do succeed in poisoning the institutions, gutting and replacing them, you can bring about the collapse of the institutions and even cause a dis this disintegration of the culture. I would argue that's kind of difficult, but you could theoretically disintegrate the culture that underpins them, but you cannot reconstruct those institutions and create the new desired hegemony unless you can rege re regenerate culture, which is precisely what Marxism cannot do. No ideology can do that. Ideologies are incapable of regenerating culture. It is a semiotic problem, a problem that Gramsci and Marxists in general are completely oblivious to. As I said, I'll be making videos on semiotics soon, but basically semiotics is a study of how the mind processes information. So the ideological poisoning of institutions is all that can be achieved through cultural Marxism. And with that, the implosion of the target society at best. But cultural generation cannot be achieved and will not be a result of this cultural Marxist social deconstructionist project. Cultural Marxism will not create hegemony. It will destroy the institutions, which is what it's doing right before our eyes, but it will not be able to replace them. It will gut them. It will, if allowed to go far enough, destroy them, but it will not replace them. So this is what we are witnessing today right before our eyes. Our society is being poisoned and in many ways, it's starting to disintegrate. Uh, Europe is further down that path. But we might also ask, after 100 plus years during the fastest changing time period in human history, with the greatest access to stored knowledge and the fastest means of communication in all of human history, who are the imbeciles or the maniacs who are still proposing socialism is a solution to anything whatsoever? Who are these people? And what are they really trying to accomplish? They can't possibly be seriously pursuing utopia. Every Marxist state has produced nothing but genocide, mass incarceration, starvation, social implosion, and misery. So what are they actually pursuing? Or has Marxism simply become a kind of social virus, a social disease that is now spreading throughout Western civilization and the world with no real direction or purpose anymore? It's hard to say. Is the United Nations, the European Union, and our democrat 
party simply the symptoms of a mindlessly spreading mental, emotional, institutional disease? Okay, like the coronavirus, we are better off at this point in curing the disease rather than overly concerning ourselves with its origins. Nonetheless, we will at some point have to confront that. But for right now, let's just seek the antidote. So back to Gramsci. For Gramsci, the battleground is ideology, at least according to this narrator. Uh, by the way, there's another uh, YouTube that you can look at. Uh, it's very interesting. I put it at the bottom also. Okay. According to them, the, uh, the battleground is ideology for Gramsci, and for Marxism, the battleground was the means of production. But again, Gramsci cannot fathom that ideologies are also manufactured products, not causes. Just as Marx could not fathom that the means of production are themselves products and not causes. This is something I'll elaborate more when I discuss freedom and creativity in relation uh, to techno-anarchism and the current, believe it or not, the current festival culture. Bear with me on that. I know a lot of you are looking, what? But just bear with me there. Even the means of production are actually byproducts of the creative process. That's something that uh, when we think about it and dissect it, may or may, not, may or may not agree with me completely, but it's definitely a different approach even to uh, the flaws within uh, Marxist ideology and uh, the dialectic. All right, so the means of production do not generate culture. It's another fundamental Marxist and materialist misunderstanding of culture and human behavior. Both the means of production and social hegemony are brought into being by culture, not the other way around. Even the material dialectic and or the ideological dialectic, an argument that is not relevant here, which one is first or, or prominent, preeminent, and who cares, were generated from within a Judeo-Christian worldview, a fundamentally Christian cultural value system. Ideologies, including Marxism, are themselves brought into being as unintended cultural byproducts. Uh, this is me speaking in much the same way as the human body can generate its own diseases, its own cancerous processes, as unintended consequences of its own reproductive process. It's basically what cancer cells are. This, of course, is part of my argument that ideologies are in themselves mental, emotional diseases that cut, that cut us off from reality and therefore are impediments to our survival, as opposed to present-day assumptions that ideologies are enabling and empowering mental structures. I'll be continuing this uh, argument throughout the discussion series, so just bear with me. The means of production, along with the division of labor or class differentiation, are byproducts of the creative process that in their aggregate manifest as culture. Now, this will seem kind of radical to you, that I'm actually proposing that the means of production themselves and the, the division of labor or class differentiation are byproducts of the creative process. But I can substantiate this. Uh, you'll have to bear with me. You can't do this in one video, but as I move along, let's see if you agree with me. So culture cannot be recreated or generated by changing the social institutions, much less by infesting these institutions with an ideology, gutting them, and then replacing them with mental and emotional structures that are completely inimical to the underlying culture. In other words, this attack and replace, or as I called it, gutting and replacing, will never restructure culture. It will never create hegemony. It can create chaos, create civil war, can create a lot of problems, but it will not regenerate culture. All I have to do is look at China. They finally realized it, whether they formulated it in their own mind in these terms, and went and back and re-embraced traditional Chinese culture. Again, that's why China is a national socialist or fascist nation at this point. The changes in institutions will not change the culture, but if they are sufficiently poisoned with ideology, those infested institutions can in fact implode. We are witnessing the start of such an implosion within our education uh, institutions. The university system is starting to contract for the first time in its centuries of existence. That's right, more and more people are waking up and not going uh, to colleges. And I would definitely tell you that if you are of an age that you have kids, you have uh, children, do not 
do not send them to a, a mainstream university. Absolutely do not. It's poison, especially in the humanities or the social sciences. But as you can see, they're even infesting the sciences now. Look what they're doing with math. Uh, we'll do something on that later, but in other words, you can see it. It's happening right in front of us. But if the powerful resurgence of the traditional cultural revival going on in Russia today after a half a century of Marxist poisoning is any indication, the robust underlying culture will inevitably resurge. That's what we saw in China. However, how much damage is created in the process? Well, don't take my word for it. <laughs> Definitely don't ask a university professor. Do your own homework. What happened in Russia between the Bolshevik Revolution and the fall of the Soviet Union? One massive nightmare. The history of the Soviet Union should tell you all you need to know. And again, the catastrophe that was the Chinese attempt at the cultural revolution or cultural reconstruction is even more revealing. But traditional Chinese culture is nonetheless back with a vengeance. Uh, if you watch Chinese uh, cable television, which I do on occasion, they have one channel that's devoted to glorifying the, the, uh, the imperial uh, tradition, traditional Chinese culture and its history, and another one uh, vilifying their traditional enemy, which is Japan. But whereas in Russia, Marxism has been defeated and driven out, China simply made the inevitable transition to the other side of socialism into fascism, as I pointed out, as we've already discussed. It had no choice, either transition to fascism or abandon the socialist project altogether. The Russians abandon it, the Chinese progress to fascism. This is the great mistake assumed by what Marxists call the long march through the institutions. You can attack and replace the institutions, yes, but you will not generate a cultural hegemony as a result. Here's where Gramsci was simply wrong. He identified the right problem, it was culture, but Marxism or any other ideology is not a solution to that. And this is because culture wasn't generated by the bourgeoisie and the social institutions to begin with. It's, to me, it's kind of crazy that Gramsci even assumed that. But again, it's all top-down. It's intellectualism, top-down, right? These were all students of, uh, of Hegel at one time. Hegel is another subject, which I'm not even interested in. If you are Google Hegel, there's, there's a lot on that in its relationship to the early Marxists. So even the material dialectic did not give rise to the common sense or to Gramsci's hegemony. Right. So then, what generates hegemony? Culture creates what Gramsci is calling hegemony, not institutions, and certainly not ideology. So where does culture come from and how does it come into being so that it then creates what Gramsci calls hegemony or culture, cultural values? Religion people, sorry, religion. May sit, it may not sit well with you. Call it what you like if that term disturbs you. Spirituality, the ecstatic experience, which is where I lean towards, the mystical mind, the uh, activation of the mystical mind, whatever. Culture and religion are traditionally practically the same thing. As an anthropologist, I can tell you that that is true. You may have to need to do your own research to uh, come to that same conclusion. But religion and culture are practically synonymous. I'm not referring to dogma now. Don't mistake religion for dogma, doctrine, texts, or even myths. I'm referring to experience. The root of all religion is the ecstatic experience, the varieties of the ecstatic experience. But I'm religion is rooted in the varieties of religious experience. The religious experience is rooted within the human body. Now, the only model that we have for describing this process is called biogenetic structuralism. Uh, you can Google that or wait for me to do a video on it, which I will very soon. It's, it's fascinating. Is it completely correct or not? Uh, the Academy, of course, has abandoned it. This is not something the Academy wants to deal with, believe me. But nonetheless, uh, I highly recommend uh, for you to take a look at biogenetic structuralism. For the present, we only need to mention what are the results of the ecstatic experience. So I'll summarize it as follows. The ecstatic experience generates what I call knowledge of the self in relation to self to the self, knowledge of the self to the self, self to the community, 
the self to the operational environment, that is the particular environment that a, a people happen to live in, whether it's seasonal, desert, and then, and this is extremely critical, the self to the cosmological. And I know you're saying, you know, you're hearing the da 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 You just have to bear with me on this because there is no, there are no people and there is no culture on planet Earth, none, that do not have as a central feature of their culture the relationship between the self, the community, the operational environment, and the cosmos. Again, not one. This is fundamental to humanity. And I am saying it is fundamental to humanity directly because of the varieties of the ecstatic experience. Whether it's homo delusionalis, is, is, this, is, it, is the experience completely delusional? Okay, fine. Or is this the root of homo sapien? We should really call ourselves, as uh, Mircea Iliad, one of, one of the great anthropologists who wrote a lot about on, uh, he wrote a lot about shamanism. He called, well, he said that we should be called homo religiosus. And I think he's, he's nailed it because that's where the sapien part comes from. So the self to the cosmological, and this is actually the most powerful salient characteristic. It locates the human being and the society within the cosmological at every level of being. It would seem counterintuitive, right? That the most salient aspect of the religious experience is what would seem to have the least impact upon the immediate concerns of survival, right? So how does this happen? And why does this happen? Well, again, here's where I would say enter the ritual spiral. It's my model to explain why it is that the ecstatic experience is in fact at the center of human culture and is at the center of humanity. It's not peripheral, it's at the center. Uh, it's called the ritual spiral. I, again, I built this on the, uh, I, I built all of my model on, on the shoulders of giants. With uh, semiotics, it's purse. With uh, the ritual spiral, it's uh, on Victor Turner. His concept, his concept was the ritual cycle. Turner was a communist. He was a member of the Communist Party in England. He was a member of the Manchester School. Uh, he became an American citizen. He married uh, Edith Turner and uh, converted to Catholicism. And his wrote these excellent books on pilgrimage and a concept that he developed called communitas, communitas. And of course, the Marxists all went just insane over this. But by then, he was so established as a profound and uh, prolific anthropologist, they couldn't just dismiss him. Uh, they attacked him. They sent these mental you know, dwarfs, Sal, Sna, Salno and somebody else, tried to turn the uh, concept from communitas to uh, you know, belittle it with um, uh, pilgrimage as tourism. Anyways, it's, uh, we may deal with that at some point. Uh, right now, just to acknowledge that the ritual spiral, I took a lot of uh, Turner and I have built upon that. Just as my semiotic was built a lot on the uh, Charles Sanders purse. And biogenetic structuralism, I've also added my own, uh, I don't want to say touches to, but I've expounded and I think built upon that. And it's also central, central to uh, my model that I call, in general, the ritual spiral. So the ecstatic experience generates a ritual system, a semiotic and behavioral system that processes what I'm calling knowledge of the self. The ritual system generates religion, which is structured behaviors and internalized values. Religion is then the underpinning of what manifests as culture. From culture arise institutions to preserve and further cultural values and behaviors. In other words, culture, from culture arises the institutions that then preserve, promulgate the cultural values and behaviors. So you see how Gramsci is, is entering this process so late down the stream that he thinks he can reverse the stream from the institutions, and he can't. The drive is from the experience from religion and culture to institutions. The semiotic arrow does not go backwards in anywhere near the same force. And we'll see that when they talk about the social construction of reality, for Christ's sakes. I mean, that's where it really gets just nuts. 
But uh, again, that, that's for another time. These values and behaviors are actually the true engines driving the means of production. So let me just back up again. From culture arise institutions to preserve and further the cultural values and behaviors. These structured behaviors and values are actually the true engines driving the means of production. I'll be elaborating and providing examples as the discourse series progresses, the Jolly Scholar, uh, Jolly Scholar 888 series progresses, including devoting entire video presentations to this subject. That's where, believe it or not, uh, transformational festivals will come in towards the tail end. But I think you'll, I think you'll appreciate it if nothing else. Uh, there's a method to the madness. So as you can see, the social institutions don't arise until late in the process. In other words, late downstream. And the semiotic arrow does not travel in both directions with anything like an equal force. Culture, culture will inevitably lead to institutions, but social institu institutions will in no way lead back to culture. You can attack, rot, and destroy any social institution or all the social institutions, and you will still not arrive at cultural hegemony. Hence the fatal flaw of cultural Marxism and its attack and replace strategy. It can attack, it can destroy, but it cannot replace, especially not with ideology. The semiotic force from institutions to culture is pit excuse me, the semiotic force from institutions to culture is pitifully weak in relation to the powerful, inevitable force that moves from culture to social institutions. Add to that the fact that Marxist ideology springs from absolutely no human behavioral or experiential root whatsoever. It's just an intellectual, I don't want to say masturbation, it's basically what it is. And we cannot be surprised at its utter failure to create any kind of cultural hegemony whatsoever. It's never done it. Marxism can destroy, but it cannot create. Once we understand that ideology is a disease and not a strategy for human self-improvement, then the inevitable social collapse that results from it when it infests the social institutions is revealed. And we're seeing that right in front of us. And culture? The ideological disease will never even get to that level. The society will implode before the culture is actually eradicated. But after who knows how much heartache and destruction. But it is culture the manifestation of human creativity that will resurge and pick up the pieces of a shattered society and start over. It's what happened in Russia. The resurgence of the Russian church and Russian traditional values is now, it's almost like communism was never there. The resurgence is so powerful. But we have no intentions of waiting for that. We have no intentions of waiting for cultural Marxism to infest and further disease our society, wait for the institutions to collapse. We the people need to stop this disease now. So let me say it again. We the people need to stop the disease now and by whatever means necessary. So, and again, I'm reading here from, uh, this is Pedro Blas Gonzalez and uh, I'll put the, uh, the link below. According to Marxism and its many derivatives, spontaneity in human beings is the greatest enemy of statism. Instead, only theories that lay out a planned existence by Marxist intellectuals are consistent with man's future emancipation. Like small children who must be closely guarded and watched for their own good, mankind cannot be allowed to waste its otherwise valuable energy on trivial endeavors like Reflection on the nature of God and contemplation of the self. So again, how can we prevent this from happening today in our Western civilization? I have argued and will continue to argue that ideologies are a kind of mental, emotional, social disease that unfortunately can emerge within a society and if left unchecked can destroy it. The society, it can or at least cause untold suffering. But in no way can ideology generate or regenerate culture, generate or regenerate culture. But with the implosion of the social institutions, catastrophes and draconian dictatorships follow. This is what we've seen. As I've already suggested, asking who or what is promoting the disease of cultural Marxism throughout our society is a mute point now. 
the disease has metastasized and is spreading of its own momentum, regardless of where it began or who is still 100 plus years later deliberately promoting it. Regardless of who is behind this demonic sick project, it is we the people who have to stop it. And after all, we should be highly incentivized to stop it because we the people are going to be the primary victims. So here I uh, bring up the third, which I've, I've mentioned briefly, is I am proposing techno-anarchism as an antidote to the disease of ideology, a social, political, economic, technological means of production antidote, but not in any way itself a substitute of culture. It's an antidote to the disease of ideology and, in a sense, a replacement of the means of production as they've uh, developed over the last few centuries. It's a set of practices that will resist oppression from the ideologically driven and diseased institutions that now surround us, while at the same time safeguard our own cultural inheritance. So in other words, for me, techno-anarchism is a way to preserve our culture and our cultural inheritance. So why anarchism? Because we're still left with the, pre, uh, with the perennial human dilemma, how can humans avoid oppression? But why be concerned with oppression anyways? After all, traditional cultures did not find authoritarian structures of dominance and submission to be intolerable at all. And that's true. In fact, they were considered the structures of dominance and submission, especially if mitigated by moral values to be largely, largely indispensable. Highly authoritative and yes, oppressive systems of social order have worked splendidly, sorry, for millennia. Why change that now? Oppression suppresses human freedom and human creativity. Okay, so let me say it again. Highly authoritative and yes, oppressive systems of social orders have worked splendidly for millennia. Why change now? Because oppression suppresses human freedom and human creativity. As humanity has evolved, these two qualities, freedom and creativity, have become increasingly essential to the human survival and to human progress. We are evolving beyond aristocratic culture and aristocratic societies towards societies of individual freedom and creativity. This is my position at any rate. Anarchism offers the best social political platform as a starting point towards a new dialectic, a new approach to human self-organization and the emergence of a new expression of human culture. Again, anarchism is not a substitute for culture, but it is a restructuring of the social order, which is downstream of culture. The form of anarchism I will be promoting is my formulation of techno-anarchism, which the term I, I didn't invent. It's my formulation of it. And admittedly, this is a work in progress. So, I'm going to embark upon a second mini-series like I did with the Seeger series. I'm calling it Into the Forest, the Satyr Procession, a prelude to techno-anarchism, and with a focus on the ecstatic experience. Along the way, I will be fleshing out my model of culture that, as I've said before, I'm calling the Ritual Spiral. I will begin this new series with a discussion of Frederick Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy. Nietzsche referred to this experiential search for truth as the Satyr Procession into the forest in order to encounter the paradox that lies at the heart of existence. Hence why I'm calling the series Into the Forest, the, Sa the Satyr Procession. So anyways, that's the purpose of, uh, basically I've also outlined the fundamental engine be behind my Jolly Roger Triple H series to explore these issues together. And I wanna tell you that I don't care for martyrdom I hope we will enjoy this procession, uh, excuse me, this process of exploration, that we'll be excited and stimulated to positive and even ecstatic activities towards changing the direction our society is currently taking. So for the present, sitting down with a good cigar, an espresso, or a good whiskey, and thinking and writing about what is important to me as the greatest, is the greatest feeling in the world. Okay, well, okay. It's definitely in the top two, okay? And then, of course, we must act Go forth and put our ideas and solutions to work. Not act. Oh, and by the way, did I mention... Test.
that cultural Marxism must be driven out of our universities. I thought I'd mention it anyways. Racist! Fascist!